Okay, this sermon is entitled, Supernatural Concepts. I'd like to open up with prayer, and then with a few verses. All right, dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 126 reads, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that, that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Now, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we see that the unsaved people out there of this world, those that have rejected the gospel, these people cannot understand the supernatural. A lot of people will consider themselves, you know, naturalists or humanists or atheists or agnostics or anti-theists or whatever. It's because they can't accept what the Bible teaches. Now, the Bible is an ex- extremely supernatural book. It came from God. It's God's word. There are lots of concepts in the Bible that cannot be explained through pragmatism and through, you know, just logic and basic, you know, epistemological or ontological, you know, means. And that's why we have to understand them through supernatural or preternatural lenses. We have to look at them with the, with the understanding that this is not something that the natural man can grasp on his own. And it's impossible for this. And we see this in verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, the reason why the unsaved person cannot grasp the things of God is because they don't have the Holy Spirit inside of them. The, the simple fact that the believer in Christ has the Holy Spirit in, indwelling them is why they're able to understand things. That's why we understand that salvation can never be lost. We understand eternal security. We understand salvation by grace. We understand that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. The resurrection in and of itself is supernatural. So we're going to look at some more verses on this. and it, let's, let's just keep reading here. Verse 15, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things... Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Believers in Christ have the mind of Christ. We understand the things of God. Now let's take a look at another verse that talk, or another, or a few more verses that talk about this. And then I'm going to get into some of the supernatural concepts about the Bible. I want to kind of stay focused on the subject of salvation, because this is the main thing the unsaved people will not understand, and salvation is a supernatural thing. So let's turn over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, let's take a look at a few verses here. Let's start off with verse, in John 3, let's start off with verse um, verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Now, what's he talking about? Obviously, the concept of being born again. This is a supernatural concept. When a person is born into this world, it's a physical birth. When a person is born again, they're born of God, and they're born from above. This takes place in heaven. Okay, so he's talking about supernatural things here. He says in verse um, 12, it reads, uh, let's see, If I have told you earthly things, ye believe, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now, the fact that you know Jesus Christ can come down from heaven and then take upon himself the sins of the whole world and die on the cross, that's a supernatural concept. That's why these unsaved people out there don't grasp this. They also, they don't grasp eternal security. They don't understand how we can be saved forever because eternity is a supernatural concept. Now, let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, we see the eternality. That's a supernatural you know, concept. 1 Peter chapter 1, let's just jump back to verse... Um, 21, it says, Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. So even the concept of God is supernatural. Verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, 
See that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Verse 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Okay, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Now, he's basically comparing God's word with things that are natural. You know, like flowers, they're going to wither away. But see, God, because God's word is supernatural, it will never go away. Okay, so we see that the rebirth is a supernatural you know, event. Okay, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. It takes God's word, you know, to, to give somebody re, a rebirth, spiritual birth. Okay, and then it goes on to say that, okay, men understand things that are natural, like grass that withers. But then it goes on in verse 25, he's, he's saying, but the word of God is different from this. See, that's why the word of God is so powerful, because it's not of this world. Okay, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible says in John 1, we're going to, t- turn, to there, turn to that in a minute, the word of God is alive. And this is a supernatural concept. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So the word of God is alive. The word of God is supernatural. And that's why you have to be saved. You have to have the Holy Spirit inside of you to understand this, to understand the things of God. Now, turn to John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1, 1, 1, we see, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, the fact that Jesus Christ, is he's the Word here, was in the beginning with God, that's a supernatural concept as well. Let's take a look at a verse that makes that clear. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. Okay, it says in, um, let's see, verse 20, and we'll stop at verse uh, 20, let's see, about verse 23. It says, I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance and I will fill their treasures. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. What this tells us is that God has always been here. We can't grasp this because God is outside of time and we are not. So this is another supernatural concept. The, the, the idea that God can promise salvation to us before we were even born is a very supernatural concept. Turn to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Let's take a look at verses 1 and 2, and it reads, It says, Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of, of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is at their godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Now, this concept is not something the world grasped at all. They can't grasp that God would promise people eternal life before they were even born, and then Jesus Christ, he was slain before the foundation of the world. That doesn't even make sense to them. Because it's not going to make sense to the unregenerate. That's why when you go back to John 3, he's, he's saying, well, if I tell you earthly things and you don't believe them, then there's no way you can believe spiritual things or supernatural things. That was the point of that verse. But my point is, this is a supernatural concept. Now, how do, how do we know that it takes the Holy Spirit to unveil all these things? Well, turn to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And let's take a look at verse 13. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us through God's word. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And that's why we understand the believers, the saved people, the ones that are on their way to heaven right now, we understand the things of God, and that's why the, the, the unsaved don't get it. Now, let's go to a verse that proves that you know, the unsaved can't get it. Turn to John 8. Okay, in John 8, we see that you know, the unsaved have been lied to by Satan, and Satan is the great deceiver. He's lying to everybody, and that's why the things of the supernatural kind do not make any sense to these people. Okay, it goes on to say, let's start off with verse uh, 45. Okay, in verse 44, it talks about, let's just go ahead and start off with verse 44. It says, You are of your father the devil, 
and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Okay, which of you convinceth me of sin, and if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? Now here's the reason why unsaved people that are believing all this garbage, like they, they think you can lose your salvation, or they think that you've got to have works, or they believe in Calvinism, or they just believe in some type of a false way of salvation. The reason why this is is because they don't have any truth in them, and it's because they're not of God. See, God made it so his believers, his sheep, would understand his words. That's why it says in John 10, my sheep hear my voice. They know me. They, they understand the things of God. Okay, but verse 47 explains to us why the unsaved don't get the things of God. It says, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. So it's impossible for these unsaved people out there to try to understand the mysteries of God. It's impossible. It won't happen. That's why Jesus Christ spoke in parables. Let me go ahead and find a few verses that talk about that. In Matthew chapter 12, I believe that Jesus spoke you know, parabolically so that his own followers and his own disciples would understand him. It's kind of like having a codified language or having some type of a, you know, an esoteric manner of speaking that only you know, certain people can understand. And we see this concept in Matthew chapter... Actually, it's Matthew chapter 13... Um, it says in verse 10, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is, it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. It goes on to say, For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Healing's a picture of like salvation, you know, conversion. But see, this tells us that the people that are unsaved, they don't possess the Holy Spirit, they cannot grasp the supernatural. Because they don't have the right eyes, and they don't have the right ears. See, whenever a person gets saved, the Bible makes it clear that the scales have been removed from our eyes. We can see. Okay, we were in spiritual darkness or spiritual blindness. But now we, we've seen the light, so to speak. It goes on to say in verse 16, But blessed are your eyes, talking to believers, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Why do you think the believers in Christ understand salvation and the unbelievers don't? Because salvation is a supernatural concept. Over to John ch chapter 11. Now, Dying for our, for our sins and then being buried and then raising again from the dead is a supernatural concept. And that's why it takes the Holy Spirit to understand this. Now, I believe anyone out there who's lost can believe the gospel. The gospel message was preached for the lost. Because, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But you have to remember that it's the word of God that allows them to understand the gospel, and the word of God is supernatural. So even the gospel message is a supernatural message, but the unsaved people can accept it because the Bible makes it very clear, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. There's, there's some that believe, there's some that don't. And in Revelation 22, 17, it says, whosoever will. So God gives people a choice. But once you, once you receive salvation, then the Holy Spirit you know, comes in us and is in us forever and, and teaches us the word of God. We can't understand other you know, supernatural aspects of the Bible without the Holy Spirit. And it talks about, you know, the resurrection in verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. This is talking about, you know, life after death. It's a supernatural concept. Okay? Verse 26. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now, here's what the natural man would do with this. The natural man would think he's talking about physical death, because he can't go beyond that. 
but obviously it's talking about eternal death, the second death. Okay? So we understand this because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and this is teaching eternal security. You're never going to hell. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now turn back to John 6. Let me give you an example of how unsaved people you know, treat the word of God. This is what they think. Okay, John 6.54, it says, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's a supernatural concept as well. That's talking about Jesus Christ promising to raise the believer up at the last day. And then that means they're going to heaven. But see, the unsaved person would think this is literal. They take everything literal. And the unsaved person would think that the Bible is promoting you know, cannibalism, eating flesh, and drinking blood. But it's all symbolic. It's, it's not literal. It's not to be taken literal. Okay? Eating, eating his flesh and drinking his blood are synonymous to believing. It's like partaking in something. Whenever you get saved, you're partaking in the, you know, with the bread of life. And we see this concept in verse 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. The, uh, the, un, the natural man would think it's talking about a, a literal thirst, like for water. But this thirst is not, it's not literal, it's a spiritual thirst. Okay? The whoever's, whoever believes on Christ will never go to hell. Okay? You'll go to heaven, and you'll have rivers of living water. Now, let's take a look at the concept of imputed righteousness. I believe this is a supernatural concept that the unsaved does not grasp, and that the saved should grasp. Turn over to Romans chapter 4. Imputed righteousness means that all of our sins were put on Christ when he died on the cross, and then whenever he was buried, our sins were buried with him, and then it's called a double imputation. All our sins were put on him, and all of his perfect righteousness, the righteousness of God, the Bible says, was, was, was imputed to our account. God has declared the believer perfectly righteous because of what Jesus Christ has done. This concept alone does not make sense with the natural man. See, the na natural man wants to trust in himself. A natural man is full of pride and arrogance, and he thinks he can try to earn his salvation. Well, the concept of grace is a supernatural concept. We don't do anything to earn it. We can't do anything to keep it, or maintain it, or lose it, or anything like that. It's all by grace. So this whole concept of imputation is a supernatural concept. It says in Romans chapter 4, let's take a few, look at a few verses on this. It says in verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, that tells us that our faith is counted for righteousness. It's not that we are righteous in our, in our behavior. The Bible says that we're all sinners. But our faith is counted for righteousness. Because of our faith alone in Christ alone, we have God's perfect imputed right, righteousness. That's the way he declares us. And he, it's like he sees our entire lives as a clean slate it's only clean because of the blood of Jesus has washed away all our sins so like I said double imputation is all, all of our sins were put on Christ imputed to him his perfect righteousness was imputed to us and that's what the Bible teaches about salvation and we see this this concept in a few verses here Romans 4 11 and he received the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. You know, the concept of having Abraham as our, like, spiritual father is a supernatural concept as well. And the unsaved have a hard time with this doctrine of imputation because, number one, it just doesn't make any sense. They don't think it's fair. See, to the unsaved, it's all about equity. It's all about, you know, fairness. And a lot of these people will even go as far to say that you know the imputed righteousness of the believer is a myth. And the only thing that really is a myth is their salvation. Because you can't go to heaven on your own. You can't, you know, produce your own righteousness. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't save you anyway, even if you could. So let's take a look at a couple more verses on this. Then I'd like to move on to a few more supernatural concepts here. Romans chapter 4, and look at verses 20 to 24, and it reads, He staggered not at the, at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now, 
that's very clear that it's not our own righteousness, it's just the righteousness of God because we believe on Jesus Christ, and that righteousness never changes because it's perfect righteousness. And in Daniel chapter, I believe, 9, it talks about an everlasting righteousness. When it's prophesying about Christ dying on the cross or being cut off, you know, for our sins. So now let's take a look at um, Psalm 19. The very concept of God revealing himself through nature is supernatural. And we see this in Psalm 19, the first, let's say, four verses. reads, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night sheweth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world in them hath he set a tabernacle for the for the sun. So just this very concept of going outside and just looking up into, you know, the sky and seeing everything that we see out there, the sun, the clouds, you know, at night the stars. The simple fact that we have this type of phenomena proves that God is real because God created it. So this is a supernatural concept. Now, the idea of creation is supernatural. Turn back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, we have the fact that God created everything. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So, this is basically saying that God just spoke something into existence. Okay, He just basically declared, let there be light, and there was light. And then he created the whole universe. He created every single human being. And the Bible says we're created in his image. If you just jump ahead to verse, um, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So the Bible is just a, a book that is chock-a-block with supernatural concepts. The next concept I want to look at is the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is supernatural in that it is basically three in one, three beings in one, or three essences in one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And this is found in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, and it reads in verse uh, 6, it says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And the Bible makes it very clear that whenever a person is saved, God enters the believer. You know, Jesus Christ enters the believer in, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual or a supernatural sense. And then the Holy Ghost as well, Romans 5.5. 5. Okay? So, this whole concept of the Trinity, in and of itself, is supernatural. Now, pretty much like I said, everything we've covered, you know, salvation is supernatural, being born again is something that God does, and I'd like to look at one more topic on this subject. Spiritual growth is a supernatural concept as well, and the reason why is because it's just, all it takes is to read God's Word. God's Word has, has a supernatural power to it, to affect and to change the people that read it. So spiritual growth, you know, existentially, is another supernatural concept. And this is another way that we can know that the, the Bible is true. We see this concept in First uh, Peter chapter 2. It says in verse 1, um, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now, the reason why this is such an interesting concept is because reading the Bible actually changes a person, you know, from, from like a moral aspect or an ethical aspect. Now, no other book can do this. You could read other books like, you know, encyclopedias or the dictionary, or you could read other you know, collegiate books or whatnot, and it may improve, you know, your intellect. You may learn things, and you may glean a lot of facts, but it's not going to change you in an ethical or in any type of way that's that bears, you know, scrupulosity. But the Bible is 
telling us right here that the Word of God, desiring it, reading it, you know, meditatively or contemplatively, has a an, a changing effect. Even in the Book of Job, we see that the Word of God is is preferred over you know literal you know organic food. So the fact that people grow as they read the Bible is another supernatural concept that we need, that we need to take into account. So now let me just go ahead and close with a few verses here. Hebrews chapter 11, what it really boils down to, whether we're going to grasp all this or not, is whether or not a person has faith. Okay, in Hebrews 11, we'll, stop, we'll start with verse 1 and we'll stop with verse 3. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. What this is saying is that God himself, by his word alone, was able to create everything in existence. And a person can either believe that or not believe it. And if you don't believe in the supernaturality or the supernaturalism that, that's presented in the Bible, then you're, you're forced believing a bunch of garbage. You're forced believing a bunch of man-made tripe. Okay, You're forced to believe all the deceptions and lies out there, like evolution and atheism, and you're forced to believe there is no God, and that we just got here by chance, and that we, we just basically evolved. And that's just a bunch of stupidity, but that's the only thing left to believe. So, like I said, a person has to be saved in order to understand the things of God, and let me just go ahead and make salvation really clear. The problem is, is that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 5, let's go ahead and turn to Romans 5 and verse 12, reads, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The problem is we are sinners. We cannot save ourselves. Our sins have separated us from God. It says in Isaiah chapter 59, in verse 2, let's go ahead and turn to that verse. It says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So that's the problem with people that do not understand the supernatural aspects or facets of the Bible, is number one, their sin has separated them from God, and they need a Savior, and Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Let's turn over to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, let's take a look at verse 42, and it reads... It says, and said, un, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the, the Christ, the Savior of the world. So Jesus Christ performed a lot of miracles, and miracles are supernatural as well. And Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, and he, he died on the cross for our sins. He was buried, and then he rose again. Once again, that's a supernatural concept. Because he did this for us, we can have salvation as a free gift. He offers it to us freely, and the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, a person has to receive you know, the gift of eternal life, and it's received once and for all. Salvation is complete. It's something that Jesus Christ finished. It's signed, sealed, and delivered. Once a person is saved, they're always saved. Faith alone in Christ alone. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And once you're saved, you can never be lost again. You can never give your salvation back. You, can, you cannot forfeit your salvation. Once you're saved, you're stuck with salvation. You're eternally secure. And this is a supernatural concept as well. So that's all I have. Let me go ahead and close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.